Welcome to the IGS University online lecture series. Today's topic is geosynthetic products and their manufacturing methods. My name is Kent von Mobersch and I will lead you through today's IGS University online lecture series on geosynthetic products and their manufacturing methods. What is today's outline going to be for this presentation? After an introduction, we will have a brief overview of geosynthetic functions, and then we will go into depth into the geosynthetic raw materials, the products, the manufacturing methods, and typical applications. I will show you some geosynthetic Geosynthetic functions are divided in two classification groups. I would like to call them hydraulical and mechanical. And the hydraulical functions are filtration, drainage, barrier, erosion control, and containment. Whereas the mechanical functions are separation, reinforcement, stabilization, protection, and stress relief. If you want to learn more and get more details on the functions, please visit the IGS lecture on functions. A geosynthetic is, as we very likely know, an artificial product or a component that we add to earth so that it fulfills a function and it is then either permeable or impermeable. So we have two groups of a geosynthetic material when we start looking into detail into it, and we know that it's either going to have a function where it has to be permeable or the other function where it has to be impermeable and basically avoid any flow of liquid or gas in any direction. In the following, I'm going to be likely more using the ISO 10318-1 definitions but please keep in mind, you might have national or international standards which describe them a bit different than you see in this presentation. So if I talk about a geosynthetic, it's a generic term and it describes a product at least of one of those components is made from a synthetic or a natural polymer. It is then formed into a sheet, a strip or a three-dimensional structure and it is used in contact with the soil or any other material in geotechnical and civil engineering applications. And if I look at the permeable side, we're going to be talking about geotextiles and geotextile related products, whereas the impermeable products are geosynthetic barriers. And then in between we have geocomposites, which can fulfill both functions, can be permeable on the one side, or at least using a product which is permeable, and combining this one with an impermeable one, or it can be total permeable, or it can be total impermeable, but it's going to be a composite out of at least two different geosynthetic types. Without going into details on the raw materials, I just want to point out the typical materials used for a geosynthetic material. They are not in order of importance, it's just a list where you can see what type of raw materials can be used and which are used. So we have polyester, polypropylene, and polyethylene, likely to be the most important ones and the most widely used raw materials. But then we also have PVA, polyamide, aramide, PVC, CSPE, EPDM, ECB materials, and even biodegradable raw materials. All of these materials can be used in combination or as a standalone raw material for a specific geosynthetic product. The earlier slide you have seen the three main groups for geosynthetics, the geotextiles, the geotextile related products and the geosynthetic barriers. And now we are moving into the general production methods 
and you can see that we're going to be talking about weaving, knitting, heat bonding, needle punching, chemical bonding, and extrusion. And you can see that the left side product groups can be manufactured with one or more of these methods, and they will be described in the next slides. So we're going to be starting with a geotextile. What is a geotextile? Well, a geotextile, according to the ISO definition, is a planar, permeable, polymeric, synthetic, or natural textile material, which could be either a non-woven, a knitted material, or a woven material, and again, always used in contact with soil and or other materials in geotechnical and civil engineering applications. So it's quite clearly said in this definition that if a product has a textile structure, then you would call it a geotextile. Before I start talking about the production methods, I need some clarification for definitions. So on the next slides, you're going to be hearing these and to make sure that you are aware of what the differences are, here's a short description of these uh, term, terms I'm going to be using. So number A is a continuous filament. It's an endless thin filament, which is sort of similar like what a spider produces. The second one is a multifilament. It's basically something where I have a combination of at least two or more filaments, either laid next to each other or twisted together. The third, number C, is a monofilament. It's thicker than a filament, a continuous filament. And then we have staple fibers, which are basically cut short fibers put together either as a yarn or they can be used as single fibers. The first group we are going to be describing today are the non-woven geotextiles. They are used typically as a separation layer, are used for filtration, are used as a protection layer on top of a geomembrane, or as a containment where they contain sand or other type of materials, or in asphalt layers as stress relief. A geotextile is typically made of directionally or randomly orientated fibers or filaments, which are then mechanically, thermally, or chemically bonded together. following slides, I'm going to show the production of these fibers, which are used for the non-woven production. And I will be talking about a spinneret and about filaments in this part. So on the left picture, you see that a spinneret is basically a small die, typically like it's on the right side, where fibers are spun out and are then either laid on a conveyor belt, rolled up, or cut into short fibers. So if we're talking about producing fibers or filaments, we talk about a spinneret for the extrusion process. Now later on in the presentation, we're going to be talking about production of sheets, and then we are going to be using the definition die, and a die is a specialized tool which is used for the manufacturing for a larger material, a bit thicker and longer than we have with a filament, as you see on the left side. A non-woven can either be produced from filaments or from fibers, but the main production process of these is similar or maybe even equal. First of all, you take chips and pellets of the raw material you're going to be using and put them into the extruder. The extruder melts then these materials together and they then are squeezed through the spinneret. And by this squeezing through the spinneret, you are now producing the endless or the continuous filaments. These can then be stretched to achieve a higher strength or any other property and are then either put on the conveyor belt or rolled up. That would be the end of the process of the filament. But if you continue this process, you then take the continuous filaments and you bring them into a fiber crimping device. In this crimping device, you are achieving a waviness in these fibers and giving them a three-dimensional structure. 
at the end of this process, you then cut these filaments into staple fibers, and the staple fibers are then put into bales so they can be transported to the purpose they have to be brought to or to the production facility where they are then going to be used for the non-woven process. We've just seen now the manufacturing of a filament and of a fiber material. Now we are going into the non-woven production. So in the first slide here, we're showing you the non-woven geotextile made out of filaments. We call this the spun bonding process. So everything you've seen in the slide before, adding the chips to the extruder, melting of the filaments through the spinnerets, the only difference is now that these continuously fibers are laid on a conveyor belt directly after the spun bonding process. And depending on the speed of this conveyor belt, you can now dictate the thickness of your non-woven material. It then goes with all those filaments laying on top of each other through the bonding process. And after the bonding process, which we will describe in the next slides, it is then rolled up to a final product, which can then be delivered to site. A second method how to produce non-woven geotextiles is using the carding process. Here, the bales with the short fibers or staple fibers are brought to the production facility. The bales are opened, the fibers are then laid on a conveyor belt and are then forced into the carding process. This carding process is basically done in such a way that you have a lot of drums. The drums are running in different directions and these drums have needles which pick the fibers from one drum while taking them over to the next drum. This way you get an orientation of the fibers, but as well as a very good distribution of these fibers. At the end, the layers of fibers are laid off onto the conveyor belt in various thicknesses and then brought through the manufacturing bonding process. And at the end, again, the product is rolled up to a final non-woven roll and then able to be transported to site. We have just seen the process of manufacturing fibers and filaments. And we also seen that these are then brought onto conveyor belts and are in some way or the other brought to a felt material or laid on top of each other so that they can be bonded together. In the next uh, slides, we're gonna be talking about this bonding process. The first bonding process is the needle punching. So there are boards going over the entire width of the belt or of the um, final uh, width of the material which we want to achieve. And these needles are punched through the layer of fibers or filaments. And you can see on the bottom right, one of these needles, they have little barbs on the corners. And by punching them down through the structure of the laid down fibers or laid down filaments, they basically drag down these fibers and now entangle them into each other. So now we are getting a soil-like structure with uh, pores and we can now simulate this uh, soil structure with the geotextile. And at the end of this process, this uh, after needle punching several thousand uh, needles through the uh, fibers and the filaments, the material is rolled up to the final geotextile non-woven. The second most widely used method for bonding of fibers or filaments is the thermal bonding process. Here the fibers and filaments which are laid on the conveyor belt are transported through two heated calendar rolls and these then melt the fibers together and bond them to the non-woven product. As mentioned earlier, geotextile non-wovens can be used in various applications, and some of the functions they then fulfill are separation, filtration, protection, containment, or stress relief in asphalt. And here I'm showing you a few examples. On the top left side, you see a hydraulic engineering application 
where a geotextile is used as a separator between the subgrade and the geotextile sandbags. Those geotextile bags are also filled with sand in this application, so it's used as a containment and as a filtration and separation geotextile to ensure the beach stability in storm events. The picture on the right side shows the placement of a geotextile filter and separator between the gravel base course material and the soft subsoil. This way an intermixing of these materials is avoided and the gravel materials maintains its performance criteria. The third example on the bottom left is a lining application where the non-woven geotextile is used as a protection layer under and on top of the geomembrane. The geotextiles prevent any kind of indentation into the geomembrane by coarse material if properly designed. The fourth application is under railroad tracks where dynamic cycles occur due to the load from the train. In this application, it is important that no fines are pumped up into the track foundation gravel and the geotextile nonwoven nicely fulfills the separation and filtration function. The second group of products which fits into the group of geotextiles are the knitted products or knitted geotextiles. These products are produced by interlooping one or more yarns or filaments or any other element like a non-woven together. They are used for separation, reinforcement or stabilization. Basically there are two patterns of knitting, warp and weft or machine direction and cross machine direction. The warp method is a method where the yarn zigzags along the length of the fabric following adjacent columns rather than a single row. The loops are joined together by moving the threads back and forth and therefore looping them over each other. On the other side, knitting across the width of the fabric is called weft knitting. Each weft thread is fed more or less at right angles to the direction in which the fabric is produced. Typical applications for knitted geotextiles are, for example, base course reinforcement or stabilization, as well as for reinforcement over low bearing capacity soils. But as mentioned earlier, they might also be applicable for separation applications. The third geotextile group are the wovens. Woven geotextiles are produced by interlacing usually at right angles two or more sets of yarns, filaments, tapes, or other elements. The typical functions they are used for are separation, reinforcement, stabilization, or containment. For the production of a woven geotextile, different elements are used. These can be tapes, yarns, or filaments. However, you don't use single filaments. Typically, multi-filament yarns are used. And these, as the name says, are a composite of a bundle of many filaments or endless threads or yarns. And they are then attached to each other by either twisting or just laying them next to each other. The second element which can be used for a woven geotextile is a monofilament yarn and this is quite evident by its name that it consists of a single solid filament which is then a bit thicker than a typical very very thin filament material. So we're talking about 30 micrometers to about 3 millimeter in diameter. And the last type of element is a slit film tape, and these are manufactured by cutting sheets of an impermeable film into narrow strips, and they are then used for the production of a woven geotextile. There are some indications that weaving was already known about 27,000 years ago. The weavers were manufacturing at that time a variety of things, such as baskets, or even wearing goods. Before the Industrial Revolution, 
Weaving was a manual craft and wool was the principal material. Things have changed since then and the method of production did not change very much since then. Maybe the raw materials did, like at that time it changed from wool to polypropylene or polyester, but the principle today is the same as in the past, just with improved technology. Like all geosynthetics, woven geotextiles are normally much longer in one direction than the other. The lengthwise threads, which are yarns, multifilaments, or tapes, are called the warp, that is the machine direction. And the other threads, which are combined with the warp and typically lie widthwise, are called the weft. So the weft is the cross machine direction, but it's also called the shot. If you produce a woven, the warp threads are held parallel under tension, but in alteration meaning one could be up, one could be laying down, while a crosswise weft thread is shot over and under these alternate warps across the width of the weft. The weave unit is then completed at the end of the second row when the weft has been inserted over and under the opposite set of warps, thus locking the previous weft in place. So basically what you see in the picture is that these yarns in warp direction, they go up and down. And exactly between those layers of yarns or threads or filaments or tapes, you shoot the weft thread through the entire direction. And then after that first shooting of the weft through that layer, those warp yarns move into the opposite direction and therefore you get an interlocking, which you can see on the right side in the two pictures with the multifilament and with the tape. The following four pictures show typical woven geotextile applications, which could be separation, reinforcement, and stabilization. We don't have a picture of containment in these, but we'll get to one of those applications a bit later. So you see the unrolling of the woven geotextiles on the sub-base and then either being covered with soil material, with gravel material, and depending on the function, they can act as a filter, as a stabilization, or as a reinforcement geotextile. The next group of permeable geosynthetics is geotextile-related products. And these could be a geogrid, a geonet, a geomat, a geocell, a geostrip, or a geospacer. And it's very easy to differentiate between the geotextiles and the geotextile related products because, in general, everything what does not comply with the definition of a geotextile and what is a permeable geosynthetic would then be considered as a geotextile related product. In general, you could say these are likely to be extruded type of products. The next group of geotextile related products are geogrids. Geogrids are used as reinforcement or stabilization in construction works. These materials form a matrix structured material. The open space due to the intersection of perpendicular ribs bars, straps, or multifilament yarns are called as the apertures. These yarns and ribs and bars and straps, they also take over tensile strength. The connection between these ribs, bars, straps, or multifilament yarns is achieved either by extrusion, bonding, or interlooping or interlacing of these elements. Now the soil can interlock in the apertures and stress can therefore be transferred into the tensile elements. This manufacturing method of extruded geogrids involves the extrusion of a flat sheet material. This sheet is typically polypropylene or polyethylene. Holes are punched into the sheet to form a desired pattern which is later stretched to the so-called apertures. The next step is the stretching process. It takes place either in longitudinal direction, creating a uniaxial geogrid, or 
in both directions, longitudinal and transverse, creating a biaxial or multiaxial geogrid. The process of bonded geogrid involves firstly the extrusion of flat polyester or polypropylene straps or bars. They are then passed through a stretching process so that the tenacity of the bars and straps are increased. And this way they achieve at the end a low elongation and a tensile strength property. In the second process, the bars are then laid perpendicular to each other on top of each other, and they are then firmly bonded together. This can occur either by laser bonding or due to mechanical bonding. The interlacing or interlooping process for geogrids is very similar to the one we described a bit earlier. In this method of the geogrid manufacturing, single multifilament yarns of polyester or polypropylene material undergo either a knitting or a weaving process to form flexible junctions forming an aperture between the yarns. At the end, some of these products are additionally coated with either a bituminous material or a PVC to increase the junction resistance. Typical geogrid applications are reinforcement or stabilization. So you can either use the geogrid to reinforce an embankment, build a reinforced steep wall, use it as pavement stress relief in asphalt, or use it as base course stabilization under a road. The second group of geotextile related products are the geonets. The sole function of these geonets is the function drainage. These geosynthetics consist of parallel sets of ribs which overlay each other and are integrally connected with each other. They can either be two or three layers of ribs laying over each other, and the angle between them can vary. The manufacturing process of a geonet is basically a simple extruder. Chips are added into the extruder, melted, and then redirected into the die. The rotating die then forms the geonet which is then again redirected into a water bath where it cools down. At the end of this water bath, it is cut open and flapped apart so that it becomes a sheet. After this process, the sheet goes into a drying operation where you can optional add a geotextile on one or even on both sides before the material is rolled up. Typical geonet applications are drainage. It can be surface drainage. It can also drain away water from a vertical wall or from a barrier system. In latter case, it can even be used as a protection of the barrier system. And it can be used in a landfill leachate collection system, depending on the chemical durability of these materials. The third group of geotextile related products are geomats. The main function they fulfill is also drainage. These three dimensional permeable structures are made typically of polymeric monofilaments and they are then either mechanically or thermally, sometimes even chemically bonded together. Optional, they can be added with a geotextile on one or both sides. Geomats are being produced by means of extrusion. Chips and pellets are added to the extruder, and in the dye, monofilaments are being formed and then laid into a water bath. There they are either laid randomly or wave structured. Afterwards, they go through a drying process, and optional, a geotextile can be added on one or on both sides before the material is rolled up to the final product. Typical geomat applications are landfill caps where surface water is drained away, football fields, 
again where drain water is collected away, drainage bridge abutments, or drainage and protection of waterproofing systems. The fourth group of geotextile related products are geocells. These are three dimensional permeable polymeric honeycomb or similar cellular structures made of linked strips or geosynthetics. The main function they fulfill is reinforcement, stabilization, or erosion control. Typical cellular confinement systems like geocells are geosynthetics made of extruded polymer sheets. The melted polymer material is formed in a die and two drum calendars bring the sheet into the relevant thickness. Optional holes can be punched into the sheet to allow later water drainage. The cut single strips are then ultrasonically spot welded together and laid together on pallets for transportation. On site they are then expanded to form a honeycomb-like structure and are filled with sand, soil, rock, gravel, concrete or any other type of material. Geocell applications can be road reinforcement, erosion control on river slopes, erosion control and stabilization on slopes, or even mechanical stabilized walls. The fifth geotextile related product is a geostrip and is mainly used for reinforcement purposes. It is a polymeric material in the form of a strip and the width is not more than about 20 millimeters. It is used in contact with soils or other materials in geotechnical application and as mentioned for reinforcement purposes. Typical geostrips are made of extruded polymer sheets. The melted polymer material is formed in a die and two drum calendars bring the sheet into the relevant thickness. Some geostrips additionally embed high tenacity polyester or other high strength multifilaments during the manufacturing process into the strip. The main application of geostrips is in reinforced walls. Here the geostrip is connected to the front facing and embedded in the backfill material. The interaction between the backfill material and the geostrip is solely friction. The sixth and last group for geotextile related products is the geospacer. The main function of a geospacer is drainage. Geospacers are three-dimensional polymeric structures with an interconnected airspace in between and they are used in applications where water and or gas needs to be redirected from a structure. Typical geospacers are made of extruded polymer sheets. The melted polymer material is formed in a die and two drum calendars bring the sheet into the relevant thickness. In a second process, a three-dimensional structure is punched into the same sheet. Optionally, geotextile components can be bonded to the three-dimensional sheet. Typical geospacer applications could be underground structure drainage, drainage in a basement system, drainage collection behind a tunnel lining system, and rainwater collection in a roof. After describing permeable geosynthetic materials, these were the geotextiles and geotextile related products, we are now describing the impermeable products, the geosynthetic barriers. These could be polymeric geosynthetic barriers, bituminous barriers, or clay geosynthetic barriers. And all of them have the purpose of reducing 
or preventing the flow of fluid through the construction. The first impermeable geosynthetic I will be talking about is a polymeric geosynthetic barrier, basically known as a geomembrane. It's a factory assembled structure of a geosynthetic material in form of a sheet in which the barrier function is fulfilled essentially by the polymers. The blown film extrusion process is the same as a regular extrusion process up until the dye. The melt is cooled in an air ring somewhat before leaving the dye to yield a weak semi-solid tube. This tube's diameter is rapidly expanded via air pressure and the tube is drawn upwards with rollers, stretching the plastic in both the transverse and draw directions. As the sheet continues to cool, it is drawn through nip rollers to flatten and is then slit open to form a flat plastic sheet, the geomembrane. In the flat dye extrusion process, the melted polymer material is formed in a dye. Drum calendars bring the sheet to the uniform thickness. Cooling is typically achieved by pulling the sheet through a set of cooling rolls. At the end, the final geomembrane is rolled up with winders. Geomembranes can be supplied with a smooth surface or a structured surface. To create such a structured surface, three methods are typically used. The first one is embossing. The embossed surface is created by extruding the same molten material from the geomembrane between two engineered rollers. The second method is impigmenting. With this method, hot particles are projected onto the surface of the manufactured geomembrane sheet, and here you rely on the bonding of the two materials. And the third method is co-extrusion. In a co-extrusion process, nitrogen is injected into the liner at the dye and explodes shortly after. And here you create a crater structure on the surface. The main purpose of a geomembrane is to reduce or prevent the flow or fluid through any type of construction. So typical geomembrane applications would be basin liners, landfill liners or landfill caps. It could also be used in hydraulic engineering applications, such as a canal liner, or it can be used as a storage system for water or other liquids. Other applications could be mining, tunneling, any application where a barrier is needed. The second group of geosynthetic barriers are the bituminous geosynthetic barriers. These are basically factory assembled structures where the barrier function is essentially fulfilled by the bitumen. The bitumen is sprayed on one or more geotextile layers or other components and formed to an entire sheet. Typical applications for bituminous barriers are canal lining systems or other barrier applications. The third group of geosynthetic barriers are the clay geosynthetic barriers, also known as geosynthetic clay liner, GCL. Geosynthetic clay liners are factory manufactured hydraulic barriers consisting of a layer of bentonite or other very low permeability materials, and they are supported or encapsulated by geotextiles and or geomembranes. They are mechanically held together by needling, stitching, or chemical adhesives. Bentonite composed of montmorillonite or other expansive clays are preferred and most commonly used in geosynthetic clay liners. Typically, sodium bentonite is used. GCL1 is showing the stitch bonding method. 
you can see the stitching row in one direction on the surface of GCL1. GCL2 and 3 are needle punched and you see a uniform distribution of the fibers needle punched through the geosynthetic clay liner. GCL3 is additionally thermally treated where the fibers are fused to the woven side of the geosynthetic clay liner. In a typical manufacturing process of a geosynthetic clay liner, a carrier geotextile is first laid on a conveyor belt. In the second phase of the production, bentonite clay is uniformly distributed over the entire width before a cover geotextile is placed on top of the bentonite. The final phase of the production is the bonding process. It can either be done by needle punching or stitch bonding. After that, the bentonite geosynthetic clay liner is rolled up on the winding system. Another step towards the GCL improvement was the addition of a polymeric barrier to the GCL. Either a thin plastic barrier is attached to one geotextile component of the GCL, or a durable polyolefin polymer is firmly coated to a geotextile component of the GCL. This development enables GCLs to challenge particular site conditions where the use of GCLs has previously been limited. The product is called multi-component GCL and it is considered a GCL with an attached film, coating or membrane which decreases the hydraulic conductivity or protects the clay core or both. GCL A and B are laminated GCLs GCL3 would be the coated GCL version, and GCLD is an adhered GCL where the bentonite is glued to a membrane. ASTM 5889 differentiates between two types of bonding, the laminated process and the coated process, and therefore they say you have a laminated GCL or a coated GCL. A laminated GCL basically is a GCL product with at least one film or membrane layer which is superimposed and bonded to the GCL by an adhesive, a glue, and this is usually done under heat and pressure. The coated GCL is basically a product where at least one layer of a synthetic substance is applied to the GCL as a fluid and is allowed to solidify directly with the needle punch fibers of the GCL. Geosynthetic clay liners can be used widely in any barrier application. Typical applications are mining, road construction, canal lining systems, or in landfills. However, there are many other applications and sometimes they are used as a standalone barrier in conjunction with a geomembrane or in case, as we just described, a multi-component geosynthetic clay liner. Up to now, we have discussed geosynthetics being either permeable or impermeable. But there are possibilities where you can combine the geosynthetics with each other. And then you could have either a geotextile with a geotextile related product, which would be a permeable product, but it would be a geocomposite, or you could have an impermeable material combined with a permeable material, and that would also be a geocomposite. So as you cannot really uh, differentiate whether it's a permeable or an impermeable material, ISO 10318 put in the between of these two the term geocomposite, and a geocomposite is basically a manufactured product using at least one geosynthetic product among the components. To give you a better understanding of what a geocomposite is, I have listed a few examples. The first example is a drainage application. Water is drained away through the drainage core, but the geotextile nonwoven acts as a filtration and separation layer preventing fines penetrating the drainage core, which would then reduce the drainage transmissivity. 
In the second picture, we are looking at a reinforcing geogrid combined with a geotextile nonwoven. Placing a geogrid between a coarse gravel aggregate and a fine coarse subgrade, the geogrid will act as a reinforcement, but fine particles could still pass into the gravel aggregate, reducing its performance. The integrated geotextile nonwoven in this case would act as a separation and filtration layer. If an erosion control material needs to be installed on a slope, but the friction angle between the erosion control material and the subsoil is not sufficient, an additional reinforcement material is required. This third example shows the geosynthetic solution, a combination of an erosion control mat combined with a reinforcing geogrid. The last example is a barrier application with a geosynthetic clay liner over which armor rock will be placed. This placing might damage the geosynthetic clay liner, so a protection is required. Even a very thick nonwoven might not be sufficient, so a sand protection layer is integrated on the top of the geosynthetic clay liner and all components are needle punched together to achieve protection and the barrier function under this specific condition in one product. In the following slides, I'll show you some applications with geocomposite materials. The top two materials are basically drainage materials wrapped with a filter geotextile. The left one is a side drainage core installed in a road. And in the right one, you see a strip drain, which is used for enhanced consolidation. In both, you want to avoid that fines could infiltrate into the core, reducing the flow capacity of the drainage core. The bottom left one is the geosynthetic clay liner or bentonite mat with the sand ballast layer I described in the slide before. You can see the coarse material being placed directly on top of the geosynthetic clay liner. And there is a risk that the geosynthetic clay liner could be damaged. And for that reason, the sand ballast layer was needle punched together in this composite material. On the right side, you see an erosion control material on a steeper slope. And to avoid a sliding of this erosion control material, it was reinforced with a geosynthetic uh, reinforcement material with a geogrid. The top left picture shows an application where a separation and filtration geotextiles is integrated into a reinforcement geogrid to avoid that fine particles from the subgrade infiltrate into the gravel ballast layer on the top. The other applications you see are basically geosynthetic composite materials which are filled with other materials. On the right side, on the top, it is a geotextile which encapsulates sand because in applications where you have water current and a strong water flow, you could probably not install a regular geosynthetic uh, geotextile material without that material being flowing away during insulation. So by putting a ballast sand layer in between two geotextile components, you can install this type of material which is used as a filter layer even underwater. Then you have two other applications for erosion control or as a barrier system, the left one being a grout filled geotextile and the right one being a concrete mat. Further geocomposite applications are shown on these pictures. The top left picture shows drainage pipes integrated into a geotextile. The purposes can be either collecting water or draining water into the system, for example, in agriculture applications. The right top side is an oil absorption mat. And on the bottom left side, you see a geomembrane with an added protection geotextile on one or on both sides. On the bottom right side, we have reinforced membrane tubes for water collecting or for any other storage of a liquid. There are a variety of uses where geocomposites can be used and there are almost no limits to the imagination. The following pictures show some speciality products 
which incorporate geosynthetics and might not be a geocomposite, but do reinforce the statement that there are almost no limits for the use of geosynthetics in geotechnical applications. So on the top left side, you see sand-filled geotextile containers, for example, for coastal protection or erosion control in riverbanks. Then you have geotextile encased soil columns or reinforced artificial grass with solar panels attached to them. And on the bottom right side, you see geotextile dewatering tubes. If you are using drawings showing geosynthetics, it is a good idea to clearly identify the geosynthetic with a specific symbol and or with an abbreviation. IGS, as well as other organizations such as ISO or ASTM, have documents with geosynthetic abbreviations and graphics how the geosynthetic could be used in a drawing. Additionally, the geosynthetic could be marked with an abbreviation of the type and for what main function it is used. This could be done by circling the abbreviation and arrowing it to the geosynthetic in the drawing. However, there should always be a window for symbols used as well as the full wording, as some of the abbreviations might not be known by the user. Geosynthetics have a lot of advantages and add many benefits. In most cases, they have significantly lower carbon footprint than traditional materials. They protect vital resources. For example, you need less clay or less gravel. They are more efficient construction materials with longer service lives and less maintenance. Geosynthetics are easy to handle and to install. But mainly, they are reliable. For over half of a century and more of projects and innovations prove this fact. And finally, they have an enhanced performance. They have the ability to respond, absorb, and adapt to, as well as recover in a disrupted event. So allow me now to briefly summarize the content of this presentation. First of all, geosynthetics are divided into two main characteristics. They can be permeable or impermeable. Second, geosynthetics are used to fulfill hydraulic and or mechanical functions. Third of all, geosynthetics can fulfill one or more function at the same time. Fourth, different products fulfill different functions, but the variety of the products allow you to choose the correct product or the combination for nearly any geotechnical application. And last but not least, geosynthetics offer a lot of add-on benefits, and there are nearly no limits of their use. So that was it. I would like to thank you for participating and listening to this presentation. I would suggest you get connected with IGS, either via LinkedIn, Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. And of course, you can join as a member. So please visit our website, www.geosynthetics-society.org.